Welcome to the Ignite Your Life podcast. Here we interview successful people who are living a life filled with adventure, excitement and fun. Learn where they're being. Explore where they are going. See what gets them out of bed in the morning. Find out what drives them. We will go through their lowest points and we will look at the opportunities and possibilities that are now presenting to them. Come on a journey of ignition. I'm your host, Leanne Blaney. For more information, go to ignitepodcast.com. Let's ignite. Wayne Pina Rosamond has had a very interesting and, as he says, if not bizarre life, full of wonderful times, scary life-threatening times, and, of course, times of great sorrow and sadness. As a child, he went to 17 schools and has lived at 61 different addresses. Everything that Wayne has experienced has helped him in being able to assist others understand what is happening to them in their lives and assist them to gain some clarity. From a young age, Wayne knew that he had the ability to speak with spirit and see things others could not. When Wayne grew older and lived alone, he was devoid of spiritual involvement, but then he finally accepted his fate and path in life at 44, when his life was at its darkest. Over the last 11 years, he has grown, developed and understood what he is meant to be doing. He believes he is on the right path of helping others heal themselves, be a guide and give people insights into their possible futures. Hi Wayne, welcome to the Ignite Your Life podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. I'm really excited to share your story. So shall we get started? Yep, please do. Excellent. All right. Do you want to tell us a bit about where you are now? What's actually happening for you right now? Um, Right now, um, I am the event coordinator for four different um, healing expos, uh, alternative um, therapy, natural therapy, and even Western medicine-based expos, which run through southeast Queensland. Um, by the time that this one goes to air, we would be heading towards Gympie uh, for our one in September, which will be the last expo for 2018. Um, but we're also running for the first time this year a thing called the Awakening Festival, um, which is a three-day music, art, culture, camping uh, festival. Um, the idea of the expo is for people is to teach people how to take control and how to take responsibility for their healing journey Um, and with the awakening festival adds an extra element to that which is taking charge and control and responsibility for the planet's health as well as their own health so that's what i'm that's what that's what keeps me busy yeah sounds that way sounds awesome though i love it so what about your story where have you been to lead you up to this point oh We don't have long enough in the podcast. Um, So the very brief version is, um, as a child, um, I was very psychically aware. Um, Used to see a lot of stuff and things happened. Um, And, you know, went to uni and did my party trick, as I used to call it. Um, And then my party trick started going a little bit south in my early 20s when I all of a sudden started seeing people dying and and the rest and it all became a bit scary to be entirely honest Um, and as I grew up out in the middle of the nowhere in country New South Wales there really wasn't anybody to guide or instruct or help me at that particular point Um, so I just turned away from it and I went no this is too hard it's not fun anymore Um, I don't really like seeing these things Um, and basically told the universe to go and stuff itself for one of a better term Um, and went off on my own merry little way for the next 20 odd years Um, not realizing at the time that you can't really switch them off Um, anyway by the time I got around to about 44 Um, My life was probably in the deepest, darkest hole that it had ever been in. And I'd been in many a deep, dark hole, even in my teenage years. Um, And this was the worst place that I'd ever been. And so I just turned around to spirit one day and went, okay, I give in, you win. Um, Whatever it is that you want me to do, whatever plan that was for you, for me, whatever, I'm not going to argue with you anymore. If you tell me to jump this way, I'll jump that way. If you need me to do this, then I'll do that. Um, So that was at 44. I'm now 56. Um, 
And it probably took me about four or five years to do what I class as a brain retrain, um, where I had to learn how to do things differently and not to make my own decisions. Because as I said, I, I pretty much turned around and said to Spirit, you know, you tell me what to do. Um, and it's losing that, I don't know, need to be in control is a very difficult thing. Um, and then back in 2009, 10, somewhere along those lines, is when Spirit turned around to me and said, okay, now it is time for you to do what you need to be doing, which is to create these expos to help people to take responsibility and control of their healing journey. Um, so the first one was in 2011. Um, and, you know, we're now in 2018. And so and I think we're, by the time this goes to air, I think we're up to Expo 12. So, yeah, that's pretty much my life in a very, very small nutshell. What about tipping points for change? You said you had one when you finally gave in to spirit. What else? Yep. Is there been other tipping points for change? I think those tipping points for change really were in the five years of the brain retrain. Getting used to going with the flow, for want of a better term. Um, I've always been, and probably still am to a large degree, a control freak. Um, I really like being in control of everything that, that goes on. But I've also learned how to just let things flow. And one of the things that I find, I mean, I, I do uh, readings and healings one day a week down at Malula Bar on the Sunshine Coast. And one of the things that I find for the majority of people that come to see me, they want change. They want their lives to be different. They want something to be happening different. But I also find that about 95% of them aren't willing to actually do anything to actually make that change occur. They want things to change without actually doing anything different. Um, and if you are going to make a, a change in your life, then you actually have to make a change in your life. You can't continue doing things the same way. And as I said, that brain retrain, which is you know where I come in, um, as I said, it took me four to five years of doing things differently and understanding that doing it this way is always just going to lead back to the way that it was. And, you know, and that's just simple little things, you know, like driving into a car park, um, you know, with wherever, and you see a car space over there, you know, to the right, um, and you go, okay, well, there's the car space and spirit's going turn left. And you're going, but the car park's just there. At turn left so you turn left and you park the car and then nothing happens but you don't know if you'd park the car in the right um, then you know somebody could have hit it somebody could have scratched it somebody could have you know you could have hit somebody as you were reversing out mm. you don't know um, and that's a really big thing for your brain to get around is this whole aspect of you know just because nothing happens doesn't mean that something wasn't meant to happen. Um, a few months back, um, I had a, I was down in New South Wales visiting some friends, and I had a dream that I was going to miss my flight. So I was very conscious about um, not, you know, getting to the airport on time and things along those lines. Anyway, long story short, I still missed my flight. You know, and it was just, it was annoying. It was expensive to have to buy another ticket. But I just sat back and I've gone, I was obviously not meant to take that flight. Now, there was nothing wrong with the flight, but that doesn't mean the fact that when I picked up my car that I didn't have an accident on the way home or anything else along those lines. So a lot of times these things will happen and you have no idea why you're being told such, but you just have to trust in that fact. And that's probably the big one is the, you know, the tipping point is learning to trust your instincts. And trust is one of the other big ones that comes across to me a lot when I'm doing my work. Um, people don't trust themselves. They don't trust their instincts. And this comes back to the health thing because a large part of what we do with the expo is to get people to intuitively 
understand what is the right healing journey for them. Not their friend, not their relative, what is the right healing journey for you. Um, and that's a really big one. You know, Western medicine may be the right thing for you. You know, energy medicine may be the right thing for you. Um, complementary medicines may be the right thing for you. It is your choice and your decision. So how do you make that? You make that on an intuitive level going, this feels right. But most people don't trust their feelings and we end up in the situation we are today. So what sort of challenges have you had along the way that made you feel like throwing in the towel? Probably the, the biggest one more than anything else is um, trying to make, well, no, make is the wrong word, but trying to get uh, people to, exhibitors to realise that the expo is not about sales. Um, it is about education. I mean, the first and foremost aspect of um, the expo is about educating people. And, I mean, we take quite a lot of time, energy and effort to get um, international and local and interstate guest speakers to come and talk to people free of, you know, and so that the, the talks are free, um, the workshops on the majority of the, the occasions are free. Also for probably actually the biggest one is making the patrons realise it's not a market. Um, you know, we get a lot, oh, you know, it's a, it's a market, you know, and I'm going, no, it's not a market. It's an educational expo. You know, yes, we've got practitioners there, but the practitioners that are there are there to help you and educate you and um, for you to make these decisions by yourself. If you don't want to do anything with it, then that's your own choice. But it's getting that mentality across um, for, to both exhibitors you know, you know, I'll have, you know, we, as far as a stall is concerned, price-wise, we are quite low, but we're not a market amount, and so therefore we do get a lot of exhibitors going. Well, you know, you're too expensive, and there's markets anyway, and it's just like, well, we're not a market. Mm. We're a two-day ex health expo, but if you're only interested in sales, then you shouldn't be a part of our expo anyway. Um, you know, because the expo is about educating people. And we're doing exactly the same thing with the Awakening Festival at the end of the year. It's educating people. Um, one of my catch, fry, uh, catch cries for the um, Awakening Festival is what can the apartment dweller in Brisbane do to help heal the planet, right? So it is all about education and, edu and, and educating people on what they can do in the small ways to actually help heal themselves, take control of their own stuff, heal the planet, all sorts of things. So, but I mean, it's that mentality which has annoyed me quite a lot, but, you know, um, that's just part and parcel of what I've got to do and to get through. So what does keep you putting one foot in front of the other? Is it because of a bigger vision or...? I know this is probably sounds vaguely strange, but because I was told to. As I said, you know, 12 years ago... When I was in my dark hole, I just went, okay, you know, whatever it is that you wanted me to do, however it is that you wanted me to act, um, I'm not going to argue with you anymore. And if you tell me to do this, then I'll do it. And that's pretty much how <clears throat> I'm still not 100%, but that's how I live basically about 90% of my life now. It's very much an aspect of, you know, spirit told me to do it, so therefore I'm doing it. So have you had a bit of like, uh, like an ignition point or when things have really started taking off for you? I would suspect one of my things that I've had to learn over the last 40, 50 years um, to a large degree is to stop trying to please others. And that at various times in my life, for various different reasons, um, I, it's got me into quite a lot of trouble, emotionally, financially, legally, all sorts of other bits and pieces. It's made my, you know, trying to do the right thing by other people and trying to keep other people happy has basically just really screwed things over. In the last 12 years, that has happened again. Um, and, you know, even though I was supposedly being much better, um, and the expo was similar. 
Um, there was a time where the expo really went off track and went in a direction that it was never meant to. You know, nothing against the person that was actually assisting me with the expo at the time. Um, it was what everybody else is doing and how everybody else was doing it and all that sort of thing. But it wasn't what I wanted and it wasn't what Spirit had told me to do. And I remember um, one particular meeting after one of the expos and we were discussing and, you know, the, the other person turned around to me and said, you know, it's like you and I went to two totally different expos. You know, that's when I pulled the pin, initially pulled the pin on the expo um, and we, I skipped a year and in that skipping of the year was very much what is it that I'm wanting to achieve? What is it that Spirit's telling me to do? And then, you know, I found somebody who was more in tune with my thinking of what I wanted and, I, you know, we've done six or seven or maybe eight expos now together um, and it, it works in, the, in the, the way that we want it to work. And it may, you know, we may not get 10,000 people through the door. The people that turn up are the people that we want to be there and the um, exhibitors that are there are the ones that follow our path and our journey. Um, and so, you know, we are creating this community. I mean, a large part of what we are wanting to do is to create a community of like-minded people, um, not only from uh, a practitioner point of view, but also from a patron point of view. So in talking about that, now that things are going along all right, what's the most exciting thing you're looking forward to in the future? Being alive at 100? <laughs> um, uh, seriously. I mean, one of the, you know, and still being active. And I think, you know, possibly a large part, you know, I had a bit of a giggle at one of the exhibitors the other day and um, I said, you know, one of the main reasons why I'm doing the expo is uh, to the fact that I can get free advice from people. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, but it is very much about, you know, I, I, I definitely want to make 100 mm. um, and still be active. And so, um, you know, I, one of the, my big beliefs is the fact that for people to, you know, uh, be active at 100, they need to be making changes at 20. Mm. You know, it's not something that you can do at 95 and go, oh, well, I'm going to do this now and I'm going to be better. No, you've got to lay the foundations you know, I mean, um, and all of that sort of stuff. I mean, my, not that we get them, but my main target for this expo is teens and early 20s um, because you really need them to change um, to be the person, you know, that they, you know, that they eventually want to be. But, you know, part and parcel of being a teenager is you're invincible, indestructible, and, yes. you know, none of that's going to happen to me because that's about my parents. But they tend to forget or realise the fact that their parents used to be that age and just as indestructible. Yeah, that's just so true, isn't it? Like, it, yeah, the earlier you get it, the better. Yeah. And, I mean, look, you know, I mean, I realise, I mean, having dealt with a lot of this in the past, that if you can really get to the kids, you know, pre about 8 or 10, then, you know, when they go through their rebellious stage and eventually they get into the 20s, that innate knowledge mm. is at the back of their head. It comes to the fore again. Yes. And then all of a sudden they start thinking about all of this sort of stuff. So it is very much that eight to ten and under. You know, you get them into the stuff. And I mean, like, you know, with the Awakening Festival, as far as recycling and all that sort of thing is concerned, I mean, a large part of what we're going to be doing at the festival is teaching the kids how to recycle, what can be recycled, how to do stuff. So that basically they can shame their parents um, into doing the right thing. Yeah. And then, you know, it becomes an innate behaviour within them. And so when they're out and doing stuff, they, you know, they know that they need to not do this or they know that they have to do that and stuff along those lines. All right. Well, let's have a change in pace and do the speed round. Mm-hmm. What's your favourite book? Watership Down. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I read it when I was, well, actually, Watership Down and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, probably. Um, I am a, a definite uh, sci-fi fantasy type person. So, yeah, um, I don't know. I just loved the stories of both and read them very quickly. 
and I'm not much of a reader, so that's saying something. <laughs> Who's a mentor figure that's helped you the most? There was a gentleman by the, uh, there was a priest by the name of uh, Father John O'Halloran, who was very instrumental in my life from about 11 to 14 or 15. Um, he was a Catholic priest. He was the most amazing, wonderful, uh, gentle, kind man that I ever remember. I was going through a really bad patch with father and stepfather at that particular point in time. And he really came to the fold and became a pseudo father for a pseudo father figure for me. Um, and I've always thanked him for being there when I needed a male figure um, to be somebody there to look after me. Um, and it was an interesting scenario. He died when I was 14, which was quite earth shattering for me at the time because he had become such a, a main figure in my life. So I'm in year eight or nine or something along those lines when he passed away. And we, as the, as the school, we went to his funeral um, and I lost it. I'm a bit of a sook at the best of times and I was crying and, and the rest. Um, and the next day I went to school and um, some of the kids decided that they were going to give me a bit of stick for crying at a funeral. Anyway, the school bullies came up behind me and said to the, pers to the couple of people that were there giving me a hard time, they went, you even so much say anything to him, we will take you out. And so I had the school bullies behind me as my support mechanism. Um, and I have no doubt that he had something to do with that, making certain the fact that I was, see, it's even like, you know, it's 40 odd years ago and I'm still crying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, powerful moment. Powerful yes. moment. Yeah. What daily ritual works best for you? Yeah, waking up. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you want to get to 100, waking up is a, quite a good ritual to actually have. Yes. Um, as far as, say, spiritual rituals are concerned, I don't really have any other than, I, as I said, coming back to that whole aspect of just allowing spirit to take charge and control and, you know, basically go, okay, you need to do this, so I do it. Um, and that's, that's roughly around about it. I don't, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a big ritual person, never have been, um, of any particular type other than waking up. Do you have a favourite food? Probably, I was thinking about this before, and, and it, it sounds really quite dreadful, but probably my favourite food is cheesecake. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's a good food to have. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm partial to Italian as, as a whole. Mm. Um, but, yeah, um, you know, for many, many years, whenever I had a birthday, it was always cheesecake, and everybody knew that my birthday cake was a cheesecake. Yeah. So. Yeah, nice. Do you like the country or the city? Um, definitely a country person. Yeah. Um, between my father and my stepfather and my mother, um, I pretty much grew up in country New South Wales. Um, and there is the old saying of you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. Yeah, well, I'm pretty much that person. I mean, I have lived in Sydney and I have lived in Brisbane. I now live out on five acres, 20 minutes north of Gympie, um, and I couldn't think of living anywhere else. You know, it's just, it's nice, it's quiet, it's relaxing. If I need to go out and do some stress relief gardening, you know, I've got that ability to do it, and we've got the dogs and the cats and the animals and mm. all sorts of other bits and pieces, you know, hanging around everywhere. So, no, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I, then I, I go into the city. And it's just like, yeah, get me out of here. <laughs> too many people, too many, it stinks, it smells, it, yes. um, it's, you know. And not only that, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly much an empath as well. So, you know, bouncing around all those other people's energies and their thoughts and stuff does tend to get a bit overwhelming. What's your biggest piece of advice to give to others to help them make change in their life? The only way to make change is to change. Mm. Um, and as, you know, uh, as bizarre as that sounds, that is the biggest issue. As I said earlier, I get so many people who come to me that want to change 
but they're not willing to make any changes. Um, and that's, I mean, it's part of the article that I wrote for Thousand Ripple mm -hmm. um, is about the issues of people wanting to make change and that the fact that they're not prepared to do it. Um, they want it to happen, but, I mean, it's the old adage of, you know, bashing their head up against a brick wall um, and expecting something to, to be different. If you want to make change, then you actually have to make changes. You know, um, I lost 27 kilos over five years and it had nothing to do with gyms and it had nothing to do with dieting. It came down to me making changes in my life and addressing emotional issues that I had. I mean, I, part of my philosophy is the fact that all physical pain has an emotional base um, and weight is a, but a physical problem. Um, so you need to find the emotional things that have created the physical problem in the first place, you, um, you know, and then you deal with it, you find the people that can help you with it, and you shed those emotional problems, and as you shed those problems, then the, the weight falls, you know. But <clears throat> I've had multiple people who've come in to see me, big people, and I've gone, okay, this is what we need to do, and they go, oh, no, no. I can't look at that. That's just too hard. Okay. If that's the case, that's fine. But you're just going to have to work then on the premise that you're going to be a big person as an example. But I mean, you know, so many people want change in their life, but they don't want to do anything about it. All right. So last question. Mm -hmm. If you had a time machine, what would you go back and do differently or tell your former self? Probably the big one is to stop trying to please others. Mm. I mean, in all honesty, that really has got me into more issues, problems and dramas um, than anything else. Um, trying to make people not so much like me. I, I, I really have never cared about that per se. But it's just like trying to always do the right thing by other people. Um, and there is a saying, I'm a really big one into cliches, if you can't do the right thing by yourself, then you can't do the right thing by anybody else. Yes. Um, and I wish I'd learned that one a long time ago um, because that's probably the big one. I've got, as I said, I've got myself into so many issues and dramas and problems, all based around the aspect of trying to make other people happy. Yes. It doesn't mean that you've got to make other people sad or you've got to do the wrong thing by people. You just need to do the right thing by yourself. Yes. And that's something that I've now been doing for the last four to five years, I still don't do it as well as I should do. But as I said, I mean, it's even from, you know, readdressing the expo and going, no, this is not what I want. You know, I mean, I mean the person that was, you know, doing the expos with me before, you know, I was doing those things to appease them yeah. and not what I wanted. Mm. Um, and that for me then was a really big shift. Um, then, and I'm very thankful to that person for assisting me with that shift um, to, you know, going, no, I need to do this for me, not, and if other people want to be a part of that journey, then great. Mm. But, you know, not trying to please others. I have this saying, which basically is that if you don't like me, that's your problem. If you like me, it is still your problem. Yes. Yes. I like that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your valuable time today, Wayne, and sharing your story with us. We really appreciate it. Not would a problem. Like to, anytime. Yeah. Would you like to give us the best place to contact you? And we'll end it there. Um, probably the best places to contact me are either on the mobile, which is 0415 800 888, um, email, uh, which would be wayne at healyourselfexpo.com, um, or go to Facebook and look for healyourselfexpo.com. Oh, Dom, yeah. Heal Yourself Expo, at least. Yeah. yeah, excellent. Well, thank you very much. Not a worry. Thank you very much, Liam. Igniters, Wayne has a wonderful vision for his expos, which has been guided by spirit. I love how he talks about if you want your life to change, you need to change, not keep doing the same things. To find out more about Wayne's expos, go to healyourselfexpo.com. If you are ready to make changes in your life, to be living a life on your terms, go to my website, leanneblaney.com.